everybody welcome to a very special episode of beyond the album cover with jerrell mason or j mace to some uh this episode is really special to me because i have family on this episode we're going to talk about life home ownership and everything else in between i have my cousins bryson daniels out of dmv felicia lockhart out of texas and my good friend classmate out of florida Ship me a public sub, if you will, Miss Tanisha Burroughs. Welcome, y'all, <laughs> to the podcast. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. How are you? Yeah, man, it was just crazy that we were all sitting and talking before we were coming on this recording about how a lot of things have changed since we all seen each other and how for myself, Tanisha, and Felicia, next year, it'll be 20 years since we've graduated high school. So what's crazy about that? That um, we'll all be in different parts of the country talking to each other, or the fact that next year would be 20 years since we graduated high school? A little bit of both. <laughs> yes. I'm, I, I didn't even think about it. Time, you know, time flies when you're having more fun. I literally did not think about it until you said it. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know, yep. right? I'm just thinking yep. of how little wow. y'all Man, you, you, you get up there too. Don't worry, that gray is coming. <laughs> oh don't don't worry about it i was kind of shocked when i saw my first strand in my beard and oh. on my arm but i was like embrace the gray and of course yeah. you got to get your shaving stuff to try to shave a couple of years off but still <laughs> age come with wisdom so let's go ahead and let's jump it right on off all of us have ties to the 252 area gaston halifax county northampton county and the surrounding areas can we all talk about how special that area is to us and just seeing the economic developments that's been taking place in that area. Well, I know now where the old interstate inn is, they're going to build a Fairfield Inns and Suites. Weldon, they have a distillery down there. So they're doing a lot of things to revitalize downtown Weldon and the surrounding areas. So let's just talk about that and anybody can take this question if they will. Um, Okay. So first and foremost, um, this is long overdue. Um, there's, you know, between the, you know, if you're on 95, uh, between Ronald Crappers and Rocky Mount, you have hardly anything, you know, and between, I would say Petersburg and Ronald Crappers, you have nothing. So, you know, revitalizing this area and the things that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years, it has been great, but Um, the one thing that I would personally like to see more of is the support of the local businesses from the locals. Um, everyone to go to, everyone to go to McDonald's, everybody goes to McDonald's in this world, but how many people go to the mom and pop shops? So, you know, while we're supporting the revitalization and, you know, bridging a gap from old to new, we do have to make sure that we take care of these small businesses and local businesses in the area so that, you know, the large corporations won't come and take it over. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Totally agree. Um, and and you, you made a, a, a great point when you said, you know, the mom and pop shops. It's crazy that you mentioned that because as I've gotten older and as I continue to gain that wisdom, I understand. And as a black owner myself, small business owner, to you know to say the least it's important to support those who are trying to grow um i think you could do a little bit of both i myself personally i'll go and i'll spend whatever i feel like i can spend that i've earned that i can spend but i'll also support those who are small upcoming and things like that especially because i am that person um so i think you made a really really good point when it's you know bridging the gap overall opposed to the old and the new um, but I think overall, I think they're doing some incredible things down there. I'm not too happy with the infrastructure piece as far as the unhealthy of what they're bringing to the 252. Because again, you know, we've seen different things now. Um, when we were growing up, our parents and our and you know older um, great grandparents and things of that nature, they had farms. You know, we raised all of our food. But um, the unhealthy piece is what concerns me the most of in regards to the restaurants that they've chosen to put there when you just think about it strategically. Um, But the wine dispensary, that's pretty cool. Um, But yeah, I just don't like the health piece of it, the aspect of of the restaurant choice and no whole foods, you know, wholesome things to make sure that we can continue to thrive in that area, I think is is critical. But overall, it's, it's a good look. 
Felicia? No, I agree. Um, the health choices are, could be a lot better um, for the area. It, you know, yeah. 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 Yeah, I agree. I'm just agreeing with Tanisha there. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely agree with what everybody's saying because, like you mentioned, Tanisha, how our grandparents, great grandparents, had farms, and it pretty much went from farm to table. You knew table. what you were eating. You knew where Absolutely. your bacon, your sausage, your vegetables mm -hmm. were coming from because it was growing up right in that garden, all natural, no chemtrails. Look up chemtrails if you know what I'm talking about, and just mm -hmm. how you may see a family dollar or Dollar General on every corner but not see like a whole food or a produce mm -hmm. stand because you can remember riding down past the bridge going into running rapids past the paper mill you will see that produce stand on that right side Precisely. of the road having fruits vegetables healthier options but now everybody's all about quick 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 i don't mm -hmm. have time to cook let me just go get some mickey d's burger king wendy's mcdonald's or somewhere off of the avenue and call it a day so you just gotta be conscious about your intent and about mm -hmm. what it is that you want to have seen in your community because if you look at our area in the 252 textiles was really the big economic boom back in the day because if you can recall there were a boatload of textile mills we were growing up and how you could graduate high school on a friday get on at the textile mill by monday work that job for 20 plus years have a good pension good life for yourself mm -hmm. and when nato came in and moved those jobs overseas that's when everything started to go downhill because i don't know if you all know this um, the movie Normal Ray that Sally Field did about the mill worker who started a union at the paper mill that was actually based on the J.P. Stevens paper mill in Runnable Rapids. Wow. No way. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah, so here's the crazy thing. Um, my granddaddy, he used to work at that paper mill as a machine operator. And the lady that started the union, she grew up in Runner Rapids. And I think she went to community college in Alamance County and was living out there before she passed away. So it's just crazy how that our area pretty much had has a strong hold within agriculture. And we're still seeing that being shared to this day shout out to jay tillery and uh, i was Jamal just about Garner to say that black cotton <laughs> keeping that alive you know third doing a great job. farmer and just really just making sure that we know the legacy of what comes from that soil and how while cotton on the outside of some people may bring negative connotations of mm -hmm. how we think about the south that they're taking it and turning it into a positive. And if you go to vans.com, you can go get those black cotton t-shirts. I got Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I've had Jay's fixtures. He and Jamal, I think, are phenomenal um, yeah. what they're doing with the community there. And I think it was a brilliant idea of how Jay turned pressure into diamonds. I mean, he went to school. He, um, he didn't even go to HBCU, you know, not that it matters, but he came back home and he tied things to his roots. If you're following where I'm, where I'm going. And I just think that, I mean, I listen, I followed Julius Tillery, his entire success career. And I know some stories and I can tell you right now where he is, he manifested and he also took it back home. And, and, in that, <clears throat> excuse me, same stance, same token. I wish that I had some of the visual to make it come true at home because I do want to in, invest and do something back home. But um, I just think it was brilliant. He did it. Right. It's so, being done. Yeah. So shout out to Jay and JD doing their thing with Black Cotton. Now you're speaking about investing. And I want to talk about the importance of home ownership and especially land ownership and how, especially up and around the late gas area, a lot of that land were owned by various families and how when some folks kind of figured out that late gas and there's a nice little vacation enclave, a lot of them said, uh, name your price and buy me out. So can oh we talk God. about how important it is to maintain ownership of property and land so that way you can have something to pass on to the next generation. And uh, Bryce, I want to start it off with you and we'll go Felicia and Tanisha. So it is very important to have ownership, um, especially with land. Um, actually, I just closed uh, one of my clients and I'm a real estate agent, by the way, but I just closed one of my clients and it was a Hispanic family on 51 acres 
in the middle of Virginia. Um, and I say that it's important because you, like you said, you have to have some uh, legacy, number one. But number two, it's the space, it's the freedom, uh, being able to grow your own, have your own um, animals and livestock. Those are things that are missing in today's society. And, you know, of course, people want to get back to it. And some people say, oh, we don't know how to. But, you know, everyone doesn't have to be a ranchero. Um, you know, even if you even if we're talking about just simple home ownership. Um, you're either going to pay, you're either going to pay the bank your money for your home, or you're going to pay, you know, for someone else's home. You know, if you're living somewhere, you're paying for their bills and why not do it yourself? And ownership is, you know, the key It's really the key to wealth. I can tell you from my own personal, um, experience that I didn't even think I could get a loan when I bought, when we bought my first, when we bought our first home, my wife and I bought our first home. Uh, we didn't even think we could get a loan. And my wife just so happened to talk to a loan officer one day and she said, just submit the application and I can see what I could do. I got approved for, it was a small amount, but it afforded me the opportunity to buy a townhome. I took that townhome. We lived there for four years. And by year two, two and a half, we were ready to sell it anyway. Uh, we were looking for a home, but we didn't have to have a home. So we took our time. And we sold our home July 9th, exactly um, exactly three years and 364 days to the date of us buying our first home. We sold it and we took a $100,000 profit off of that house. And we used that money to buy a home that was more than double the size, you know, with the, the, the American dream. Um, I painted my fence white. And my HOA made me, uh, you know, turn it to a different, paint it a different color. But um, I even had the white picket fence for a little while. Okay. <laughs> Your I, wife I, has I, taste. <laughs> exactly. But it's it's so important. It, it is so important because, you know, I look at people even today and, you know, this is coming from an aspect of home sales. I sell people homes where their mortgage for a home that was, a hundred, a hundred fifty thousand dollars less than mine is more now, but they could have bought years ago. Their mortgage is higher than mine because I, you know, I bought it. I used my money that I made from the first home to buy that, you know, to pay off, you know, pay down on the home so that we could keep an affordable rate. So, you know, very first thing we're going to talk about is, you know, definitely being affordable. You know, home ownership is affordable, but you don't have to go and buy that dream home right away. You got to start somewhere. You got to crawl before you walk. Like for me and my family, it was a town home, then a single family home. Um, for some people, it's going to be a condo, then a town home, then a single family home. Or it's going to be a single family home that's not as large as you might like, or it's not as updated as you might have wanted it. But you can do all of these things over time. You can update the kitchen. You can update the bathrooms. You can change the floors and all those kind of things. So, you know, don't try to jump out there and reach for the sky, reach for the stars in the beginning, you know, do, you know, start, start with what you can afford and move up over time. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Um, so for me, um, I'm with you on that. I chose to um, buy a single family home. I was looking at a town home. It was a little bit closer to, it was closer to Houston, right? But I, as I kept looking, right, I'm like going further and further out because the further out you go, the bigger you can build or buy or whatever. And I chose a new build, but I chose it in a brand new community. So my house is one of the first 10 houses built. And now it's like hundreds of houses. <laughs> and, but I did it because I knew that my house, the value of my house would increase. Right. And then I could one day sell it. Right. And then do things like go home and buy, you know, a, a, a house or whatever and kind of get into um, the real estate. But I really did want to build wealth and I wanted to do it not later, but now. And so that was really the motivation behind me purchasing a home. Um, but I think there's so much freedom in having a home. Like one of the joys of my first year being here has been <laughs> gardening. And it's not that I'm such a great gardener, but I'll read 
Um, I have a Chinese family here, so they help me. They're like, oh, she, you know, my the mom, she's like, don't do this, do that. You know, she tells me everything to do. And it is healthier, but it's also just freeing. I enjoy it. Um, I don't have to worry about neighbors, anybody. It's very quiet. Um, and it's just something that I'm just like, man, I wish I would have did this 10 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it is so peaceful and you don't have to worry about a landlord. Okay, yeah, you got HOAs. I do, but you know, that's not that bad either. So um, I do think it's important. I just think that there's a level of freedom that you can't imagine when you become a homeowner or, um, you know, a landowner or whatever. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about that. Yeah. Now you said you were one of the first, you, you were one of the first people to move into your neighborhood. Um, and real quick, and uh, can you talk about how when you bought, when you signed your paperwork and the price of what you paid versus the last homes or what's being built right now? Oh, I mean, uh, you, know, you don't have to go into your prices, but the the gap. Oh, there is a gap. Like, even the longer I waited to make a decision, there were changes mm -hmm. in the numbers. And I mean, like, I knew I, it was a good deal because I'm like, it's a brand new development. And that was what, in September of 20, 2021 is when I kind of, made the deal and was like, okay, I want you to build my home, you know, chose my lot, all that type stuff. And just from September until March, when it was finished being built, there was such a gap. When I looked at the builder and what they were selling my house for, there was about a $60,000 gap. Not to mention what has happened since a year ago to now. I haven't looked because I don't care no more. I mean, not really. Not, <laughs> you know, like whatever. Just for but your own with that, values, you, know, you should know. Yeah. So when you buy, like, people that are buying now, I'm like, yeah. Because they're getting less less land, right? Um, They're cutting them real. And I'm like, you don't have a backyard. Like, what do you mean? Like, you don't have a side yard. I mean, not that my lot is so big, but in comparison to what they're doing right now, like 5,000, 6,000 square feet. And I'm like, that's small, you know? <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> but people are buying it, right? And they're putting a nice little house on that little lot, you know? And I'm like, hey, if that's what you want, go for it. But people are buying. Right, they're too. buying. And the interest rates have gone up. Mm. Oh, great stories, guys. Um, great insight, great perspectives. But I'm going to tell y'all a funny, funny story. I actually had no intentions of buying here in Florida. I repeat. <laughs> Jarrell, Felicia, you know, I'm so free-spirited, so outspoken, <laughs> just me. You yeah. know, when I'm, I'm my, my visions are so big. Like, I don't plan on working past 55. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Um, and so I just think, and I don't intend on retiring in the States. I want to retire because I have like property in Dominican Republic. You know, I travel a lot. So I have, I, I look here, right? I look at the bigger picture. So I say that to say, when I moved from Northern Virginia, I moved to Southern Virginia. And my story was quite different because our family house was technically there for me. And all my dad wanted me to do was come back to Virginia and I would have a house. And I'm like, no, I'm living life, you know? So funny how God works. I ended up back at home um, and I had a house, but I didn't have the experience of being a first time home buyer because it was kind of, it was kind of given to me, right? Um, and it gave me a few experiences where it let me determine what's next if I want to, you know, whatever, I don't know. So then I end up in Florida and again, Bryson, I'm, I'm everywhere, right? So I end up in Florida for a job and I moved here in the first three years, I was just trying to get settled. I moved here. I was here without my kids and my, my husband for like six months and I'm just trying to figure out, but I knew I did not want to buy a house because guess what? A house is a lot of work, right? I rented houses. I, I like calling the maintenance man. Okay. So again, I was, it, I was so adamant about, I'm not buying a house here. So I stayed in the city. Um, job is so busy, demands a lot of me. I work for family. So, you know, um, just trying to figure out what's next. So 
God will push you in these uncomfortable spaces. So then we get into, we have the pandemic and we get into the situation where we're at the peak of the pandemic. Is it leaving? Is it really not? And so all the landlords, this is when everybody was raising the rent. Oh, I'm going to sell because the market is crazy right now. So I live in a condo, a three bedroom condo. And my landlord said he wanted to sell. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like I've moved my family here. It's the numbers are astronomical right now. What am I going to do? So I tend to be kind of um, financially literate. You know, I consolidated my student loans. I, you know, debt to income ratios, all those things. So I didn't really have to do a first time home buyers program. So, okay, the landlord's selling. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Savings are halfway gone. What am I going to do? I literally called the bank, y'all, and I was approved. Like, I called the bank and some, but now what? <laughs> like, I'm actually having to do the work when the house was given to me and the opportunity to buy it and, and it be mine. I didn't have to do any hard work. So now it gets really real. And where I moved is 45 minutes North of West Palm because the houses started like a half a million. I'm like, I'm not giving anybody half a million dollars for how I don't care how much money I make. I'm just not doing it. I moved up North, but I have a college friend from undergrad that stays here. And where I moved a year prior to, she and I visited this place, the same city I'm in right now. And I was like, oh, well, it's kind of far. I don't know. Again, I didn't even want to buy. She's looking to buy. She's looking to move, you know, in a different direction for her family. Oh, no. You know, I don't know. Still trying to survey the area. So, again, fast forward a year later, the landlord's selling. I get approved. I'm not giving somebody a half a million dollars. Did I mention, mention, fail to mention? Um, that's for a three bedroom, maybe a bonus room. It's not even, you know, home we're used to a single family being four bedroom, two minimum. Down here, a single family home is considered three bedroom, two. So I'm like, okay, so now you want me to give somebody a half a million dollars for a house, have three kids. We come from a four bedroom, you know, so on and so forth. So just dilemma. But I said, it has to be destined because I'm in this moment. And so I go back or I come back to the city that me and my friend had visited a year prior to. And my house, guys, was 100K more than hers was within a year for 300 square feet less. Right. And that's OK. It wasn't the fact that I didn't move when she moved because everybody's time is everybody's time. And everybody's reasons are different. But that just goes into the generational wealth piece, you know, um, Sometimes it's not our plan. Sometimes it's universal. You know what I mean? I was mad though. So now I'm mad. I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to pay 100K more. <laughs> I'm already mad because a single family home to, uh, based on what we're used to is not a single family home here. I wasn't going to buy and I'm about to pay 100K more. So my, my experience was very different. I started out with a 3.5% interest rate because I built, I did new, new build. I failed to mention that. And by the time I bought, they gave me a year time and they, they took a full year with my good friends because, you know, again, pandemic materials, things like that. They were finished with my house guys like four or five months early. So I'm like, oh my God, you want, and my interest rate went up ridiculously because, you know, you can't lock the interest rate in until, well, every bank is different, but with me, it was three months prior to closing. Um, and so I was faced with a lot of adversity, but again, I know it's destined and because it was too easy. I literally, y'all walk, I woke up the next morning and they, they approved me. So, okay. Adversities, whatever. And I pushed through. Um, and I feel like now, although I didn't want to buy here, Florida is not a bad place to buy a house. Hello. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Um, because it's going to make the money. I don't intend on being here. I just want to be here until my kids graduate because I do want me a high rise in the city, you know, somewhere in the next four years. But again, it's all about the experience. It's all about the generational wealth, especially if you have kids or nieces or nephews or whomever that um, you would like to pass these things down to. And it's about educating yourself. One thing people can't take from you is knowledge. 
And that's why I have a plan. My husband and I have a plan four years from now to, and this is not telling my blessings. I have goals. Like four years from now, I know that I need to ask for a certain type of pain. Okay. I know that, you know, I need this amount of money put aside. You know, I know that if the interest rate goes from three to five or three to six, I need to wait a little longer, forget it, take all bets off, you know, whatever. But um, I say invest in yourself. The best investment you can make is investing in yourself. If you could do it one time, you could go, you could do it again. And um, always have a goal. Dream bigger. Because even when I purchase in three to four years to come, I don't need a four or five bedroom house. I'll take me a two bedroom, you know, something overlooking the city. But um, it's mine. And I'm, when I leave here, I'm going to make some money from it. And and that's just the way it is. Bryson, you said you sold and got 100K profit. Great. You know, I'm just not going to sell it in general unless I just get tired of it. But if I still move out of the States, I have a house in Florida. You know, it's 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 yours. And that's something that any no one can ever take away from you. So, right. It kind of reminds me of what my grandma used to say is like, you always got somewhere to come home to because that house, my grandparents' house was the family house where when a lot of folks would come into town to see family, you know, you got a spot to crash to stay the night and mm -hmm. your bedroom was so-and-so's room when they would come visit for the summer just keeping yep. that in the family and how for me my journey in the home ownership was crazy because coming out here to new mexico i got an apartment for the first time it was a mm -hmm. little studio 565 a month all utilities included but hey it was just me i didn't need to be all decked out but then, you know, I ended up moving to Farmington about a year or so later. You know, my mother-in-law had gotten sick and ended up moving in to, you know, help take care of her. So we were living in the house and, you know, she ended up passing away in January of 17. So my wife and I ended up inheriting the house. And it was her vision when she got that house back in 93 you know, to get that paid off, you know, she had some starts and stops along the way, but, you know, thankfully this past summer, my wife and I were able to pay the house off, you know, have no house payment and, you know, just really live out to fruition Benny Jewel Sanderson's dream of being that homeowner and saying that this is mine. Can't nobody mm -hmm. take it. And, you know, hopefully it's our goal, Crystal and I, that we can have our son, Isaiah, be able to pass that on to him and say, hey, no matter where you go in this world, at least you can come here and lay your head. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I think, I think, you know, while we're, you know, specifically talking about home ownership, we have to fit, we have to focus on the aftermath. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, it's all glitz and glamour. Like you heard me say, I was prepared to buy a house and I did, I mean, I kind of knew because, you know, I'm nosy slash, I kind of read, you know, things like that. I knew that consolidating loans would be like a plus, you know, someday I knew I would do it, but I just wasn't pressed. But it's also so critical that we focus on the aftermath. Um, and one of the things I would suggest when you're talking about home ownership and 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 you're in there because it's yours you got the key that doesn't mean i'm approved because mind you guys you got to stay here along the process especially if you're building it doesn't matter if you're building or not between the time you close and the time you know you initially um decide you're gonna buy you have to stay at a top tier level and you should even thereafter is it's where i think we want to go um and i would just say keep at least two times your bills in the bank, you know, at least your mortgage, one and a half. So it's a rule, there's a rule of thumb. Um, there's a rule how? of thumb here. How? Um, so first and foremost, your mortgage, and then this is just a rule of thumb. Uh, everyone's mm -hmm. situation is different, but right. your mortgage should not go over 30% of your gross income, or your net income. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, you should always have at the very least six months of savings. So for math, for easy math, let's say your mortgage is a thousand dollars a month, uh, bills are five hundred. You know, you should definitely keep enough money in there so that you should be able to pay everything off in the event of losing your job or you know, uh, paying for you know having a timely payment 
Um, also, there's this thing called an emergency fund or the rainy day fund. The average rainy day in America costs every ho any homeowner anywhere between a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars at one time. So, therefore, if you have no other savings, you should at least have you know enough fund. for that mortgage and okay. enough for that rainy day. Um, your water heater goes out and Actually, before we even say that, let's let's talk about some things. Let's talk about some acronyms here or even some some, you know, words and, you know, create a glossary real quick. First yeah. things first, you have a down payment that, you know, you sometimes have to make, especially in new construction. You will yeah. have to make a down payment. It could be, you know, depending on the builder, they sometimes they want five percent of the total amount. Sometimes they want twenty thousand, fifteen thousand or what have you. Um. But and if you're buying a resale, you have a down payment. If you're getting an FHA loan, which is a Farmers and Housing Administration loan, that's going to be 3.5% that you're putting down. Yes, there are grants. Yes, there are programs that can help you with that. But it, it's what it is. That's what you're going to put down. Um, if you're getting a conventional loan, it's either going to be 5%, which is your traditional, or 3%, which is um, a different loan if you have a higher credit score. VA loan. If you are a veteran or you're active duty, you can use a VA loan. They pay 100% of the down payment and it's backed by the Veteran Administration. Um, and then you lastly have your USDA loan. Um, I Look, I can't even think about what USDA, <laughs> USDA is right now, but the USDA loan is for rural areas. And they will pay 100% of the uh, down payment up front. So you won't be paying a down payment. But now we're going to go to this. So we started at the beginning. Now we're going to go to the end of this. You also have to pay. Um, you, you also have to pay what's called closing costs. Closing cost is anywhere between 3 and 4% of the price of the home. So, okay. and these are things that a lot of people don't know from the very beginning. So we're going to, we're talking, we're, we're, we're just throwing the numbers out here right now, just on what you would have to pay. So if you were looking at traditionally buying a home and because Tanisha says she'll never buy a $500,000 home, I'm going to go down to four. Well, well, let me, let me, you know, that's just how I'm feeling today. You never know. <laughs> Success so, says you never know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because that high rise is going to cost. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but, I'm you know, getting there. <laughs> if you're looking at if you're looking at buying a four hundred thousand dollar home, if you were if you were going the traditional route and all the money was coming out of your pocket, you should easily expect to pay twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. So you know, home ownership is great, but yes, there is a sacrifice involved. There is a time of saving or, you know, you do have to put away. You should not be spending anything unless you're a new construction. New construction is a lot different because of the timelines. You still shouldn't be spending and going on the exact, you know, those great trips and all that, you know, can't be going to Cancun and, you know, doing it big and everything. But, um, you know, the rule of thumb is don't spend anything over $400, uh, $400 outside of your normal spending. Um because you are going to get your credit check ran multiple times. Um, your lender is going to go look at your bank account. Randomly. Yes, yes. Randomly. <laughs> and then just know that one week before closing, within that week before closing, they're going to run your credit one more time just to make sure. Um, there have been situations where people haven't been able to buy a house because they finance furniture. Don't finance anything in the middle. You know, these are all extremely important factors here. But, you know, um, and I'm only jumping, I'm only using those two examples of the um, down payment and the closing costs because really and truly, there's so many factors to real estate. There's so many things that go into it. And I don't want anyone to feel as though you can't do it. But just understand that there are grants out there. Um, depending on your market, if your market is a seller's market, then you're not going to be able to ask for the closing costs and things like that. If your market is a buyer's market, you might be able to ask for the seller to pay for some of your closing costs. Um, if you're buying new construction, look at the incentives that the builder has uh, drawn up as well, because builders do give incentives, incentives as well. But you do have to look at those incentives very, very, very thoroughly because mm -hmm. 
those incentives may actually not amount to not anything. make sense they throw themselves out and mm -hmm. the builder will get you say oh we'll give you twenty thousand dollars but you have to use our lender and just for numbers sake we'll say the okay <laughs> going rate of the going interest rate, you said you're, you know, you started off, it was 3.5. So let's say the going interest rate was 3.5. That builder might be charging you 5% already. So mm -hmm. what you don't see is that that builder has already got their cost back by giving you that money. Everything is not free. And that leads me to my last yeah. point is going to say with any of this, especially if you're buying new construction, have a realtor because we do a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we yeah. have like we do not just open doors that is not our mm -hmm. only job there's a lot of behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know we read contracts for a living we go mm -hmm. we, we know your timelines better than you we know your timelines better than the building yep. and this is the reason why you have us here and not saying i will not i would never say oh you guys don't pay us because you know some people do get paid by their clients but traditionally the builder or the seller technically actually i'm let me re, let me rephrase that the builder does, will pay our commission on the new construction side for resale the listing agent splits a part of their commission and they are gracious enough to give us a part of their commission and that's how we most times get paid but there are some times where the buyer has to come out of pocket as well Wow, and good word, Bryson. I'm going. I want to ask you this. I'm seeing houses being up on the market, and the for sale sign on the house. Is it true that the longer the house sits, the more money you're losing? Well, you do have things called like carrying costs. Um, the longer the home is on the market, the more you got to pay. You you have to pay that mortgage every month. You got to pay that light bill, that water bill. Um, so yes, there are more costs, as well as the fact that the longer a home sits on the market the more that there will not be buyer scarcity because homes come on come on the market and off the market every day. But also if no one likes your home, that means that it's it's a couple reasons. I mean it could be creepy, it could have some ghosts or something mm -hmm. in it, or it could be overpriced. And a overpriced home, you know, the market talks. And that's what we use in this uh in this business. We say that the market speaks to you. Um, so when you see a home go off on the market one day and is off the next day, that home was priced right. It was, you know, reasonable. People liked it and people wanted it. If your home is sitting on the market nine times out of 10, there's reasons why people don't want that home. I can tell you right now this year, and I'm only going to use this last four months, every home, that, the longest any of my listings have sat on the market. And I thank God for this is six days. Wow. That was the longest awesome. house that any home has sat on, sat on the market. I'm getting over listing price um, um, offers day one, day two, usually. Um, and that's Northern Virginia. My market is a little bit different because we are so close to D.C. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just what the market is right now. You're not you're not in a position where you can lowball people. You can't say, oh, you're, you want five hundred thousand for this house. I give you two fifty. They're going to tell you to get out of here. Like, you know, it, it'll never happen that way unless the um, unless the home is distressed and you could work some things out then. Wow. And you mentioned markets, Bryce. And I want to talk about how now within the triangle area, you're having Google and a lot of the big tech companies moving in and how people that were living in Raleigh, Durham for decades are getting priced out gentrification and also too mm. in franklin county they're building new developments around lewisburg bun and the surrounding areas to prepare for the influx of people coming in to where the market value is going to be so high that long-time residents are going to be forced to flee elsewhere because they're getting priced out to live so again we just talk about the disparity when you have those booms of businesses coming and how it has long-term ramifications on long-term residents who can't afford to live there Man, look, you are so right. Um, I tell you, and they'll kill me. They're gonna kill me for saying this, but no, told, keep it real. We keep it. I about. told. I told my sisters in 2017, y'all live in y'all live in Durham. Durham that year, 2017. This is before I was even in real estate. I saw Durham have a what was it a 12 percent price increase in a year, and I said y'all need to buy right now. Y'all got jobs. I don't care how much money y'all make. 
Y'all need to go get pre-approved and y'all need to buy. Year over year since then, Durham's average price increase has been 18 to 22% a year since 2017. Mm. It's ridiculous. And like you said, people are priced out because where you could buy a home for $150,000 and it was a nice home. Now those $150,000 homes are $300,000. Mm -hmm. And they're taking the, you know, bad neighborhoods and they're tearing the bad neighborhoods down. And they're building <laughs> brand new homes, brand new condos, brand new townhouses all over there. You know, honestly, this is it's, it's like you said, it's gentrification. Um, but if you're in a if you're in a major city, you're going to see it happen. It's not it's no way around it. Yeah, man, it seems like they're tearing out the black Air Force One energy and putting the Birkenstock rainbow energy in there, the whole food energy in there, where you see people walking dogs, mowing lawns, saying, hi, John, how are you? Oh, it's safe to live there. Oh, didn't that used to be um Downs mm -hmm. Homes? Or uh, didn't that used to be that townhouse right by that club where all the element used to be hanging out at? Uh, it's a different type of element. And no, I'm not talking about medicinal lever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say get in while you can. I, you know, if you can. I think if is so important. And I would say um get if if you can afford it be a part of that greatness um yeah. just just make those smart decisions and um don't sell yourself short but if you can get in get in because it's 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 tricky that's why we're here trying to educate you <laughs> but if you are privy uh, you know to being able to afford and move into a home and make those conscious, wise decisions thereafter, before and after. If you could do it before, you should be able to do it after because if home, if, if purchasing a home doesn't teach you anything else, it should teach you discipline. Yes. Um, and I feel like if you can do it prior to, meaning going through the actual process to buy and, and actually get the keys now because you got to get the keys, you have to get the keys. Um, then you know, I, I think after would be it's going to be challenging because it's going to be new, and any, anything is new can be challenging. Even when you bought around the second time, right, Bryson? It was it was okay. still challenging. Um, but if you can do it, uh, it's it's a form of strength. I think it's the best way to describe it, and um, it's it's worth it though. It's yours. Nobody can take it from you, and that's what I come from. Those are the roots that I think we all can speak to. Um, may have been your immediate family or someone you related to or even close friend. People have people own land at home. Like my family, they own if I walk to walk, if I go to my family house in the Akinichi Net, right, in Jackson, some people may be familiar. Um, it's funny to a lot of people, and I probably didn't like it the most growing up just because of where it was. But now I go home, that's a peace of mind. I can shoot my guns when I go down there. Um, I, you know, it's, it's intriguing and it's enticing to me to, to, to have someone come ask us, can they hunt on our land? You know, um, and so it's rewarding, but you probably won't understand until you're in a mature peace of mind or place, um, in life to appreciate it. And one thing about it is something that no one can ever take away from you. And it's crazy that we talk about generational wealth because, there are going to be indifferences, especially if it's hereditary generational wealth. And I'm speaking on this from a personal aspect, the same property. Um, and they'll fight. And, but my thing is, why sell it to somebody else? If you follow what I'm saying, like, why, why give your, you know, this is something that we will always have. And um, it's like knowledge. They can't take it away from you. And my dad told me a funny story when we were going in, in the next, the last time I was at home. And they were like pine trees because on my road, it used, it was, there weren't any pine trees. There weren't trees at all. It was just open field. Um, our land, might I add. But, um, but it was open field. But they were like little plots with pine trees. And he said, you know what that means? And I was like, no, what does that mean? You know, I'm a city girl. Now. No, seriously. I'm like, no, what does that mean? And he's like, typically, that's when people buy land for maybe their kids or whomever. And they plant trees on it. 
that's how they're able to to um, recognize or or differentiate the land that they have invested in. They'll buy lots or buy acres, however much, and they plant pine trees. So that's why it was it was plotty. It was like we'll see some here, and then it's open here, and so it was a really really cool um, piece of information. I never knew that. Had y'all ever heard that? No, yeah, I, like I never heard that. Yeah, so when you go home, just pay attention. I mean, well, we have a lot of pine trees at home, right? So it kind of makes sense. Like, you know, even in the open aspect of it, but I was just able to tell the difference, like, because there were never trees there growing up. But again, gentrification and they're building up. So of course, people in the neck even buying land now, you know, that probably wasn't worth much of nothing back in the day, but they have just trees in certain plots and they're just growing up and, and more than likely it belongs to people. Right. And I want to ask this question. Um, we mentioned land and getting construction done on site for a home where you build it from scratch or getting one that's already pre-built. Which is the better option? Buying the land and getting the house built from scratch or buying land and getting the house already pre-built? I think that um, both have their plus and minuses. Uh, for me, it was better financially to get it built because I can determine what goes in my house. I chose like my floors, my carpet, my everything that's in here is because I chose it. A lot mm -hmm. of times if the builder builds it and chooses, um, they're going to skew it to their advantage. They're going to, you know, upgrade your front door. They're going to upgrade your shower. I mean, they're going to do whatever it is. And then as opposed to you paying maybe, 300,000 for your house, you might be paying 375 because they put certain upgrades in your home, at least for me. Um, so when I compared it, it was better for me to um, to build it. Okay. Bryson? Um, that, so that question is situational. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the time that it's gonna to take to build a home? What are your needs right now? Um, if someone, if it's a new family, wife's pregnant, you know, three, four months pregnant, and you got to, you know, you want a place for your child to come home to, you don't have the time to build. Uh, building takes anywhere between six months to a year to happen. Uh, so it really is based upon your need. Um, do you have a home to live in while this home is being built? Um, and then sometimes, depending on where you are, like if you're in the city, there isn't new construction. So you are going to be buying a home that has been lived in before. Now, for me, I'll be honest with you, my next home, I'm probably going to be the, I want to be the first one to sit on the toilet. <laughs> you know, for me. Yes, I want to be the first one to sit on that toilet. I was here. Tanisha, how about you? Um, I don't, I agree with what Bryson said, but I also feel like, um, it has to be at a level of what you can attain and what you can afford. Um, you already don't know what you can actually afford when buying a house because the numbers are so crazy. It doesn't mean that the bank got over on you. It doesn't mean that your realtor didn't tell you everything, but we got to read. We have to read people. We have to read. We have to understand what we're signing. And like you said, Felicia, you know, where it, you're like me with this house, I was like, just give me all the basics because I want to take, the time and put that into my, because especially with the numbers being astronomical, I'm just, listen, and I already feel like the house is overpriced. So again, it's circumstantial. Um, I also feel like, can you afford it? I mean, because right now, when you're talking about $350,000, $400,000 houses, you're also talking, I don't care what your credit score is, you're also talking about high interest rates and you're talking about $2,500, $3,000 for a mortgage. So in case, you know, those of you that are listening are not aware of that, that is, those are important pieces to factor in. What can you afford, right? See, for me, I'm, I don't really like my mortgage <laughs> by far, but that's also because I was in a situation where I built and I went from here to here, you know, but that was something we couldn't control. But I had a realtor. She was really good. She was an advocate for me. When she knew the market was about to come up, she probably about to go up. She probably wasn't supposed to call me. She called me. She's like, listen, when the when the market opens, the, the you know, the rates are about to go in, go up. I need you to lock this in. Do you have the money? Again, the money, like, 
do you have fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars laying around? I didn't have it laying around, but God is good. Okay. Um, but <laughs> do you have that money? Well, first of all, if you don't have excess money, maybe five or fifteen, you shouldn't be building anyway. That's for starters. So again, it's just it's circumstantial. Um, what do you have the money for? What do you see? And even even if you don't have the money, what do you see? is attainable in the a lot of time you've been given. I thought I had a year. So me, if I take anything away from here, they told me it wasn't guaranteed, but I'm I'm looking at all the factors. My friend, her house literally took a year. Well, my house was ready in six months. The good thing is I knew three months prior to closing, it was real because I had to lock the interest rate in. And I still didn't want to accept it. I'm telling them, oh, just take your time, you know, <laughs> like, you know, because I wanted the whole, you know, time. But because I'm also trying to balance out my money, even though I have it, that doesn't mean I want to give anybody all my money, you know. So you got to do what's um, what's feasible, what you feel if you don't have it, what's attainable, you know, because six months can go to, I mean, a year can go to six months or eight months easily. And it just has to make sense all the way around. Like um, if you're in a, partnership or a situation talk to your partner be very transparent know what you can and cannot do I think that's you know or what you see is attainable because I knew okay well I say you know I'm paying 2200 right now I've paid 23 dollars in rent before I know that I can do it you know the DMV Bryson you know it's expensive up there like okay so I've paid 24 2500 dollars before it doesn't mean I want to but guess what it's mine you know, so you just got to know, you have to know. And if you don't know, ask questions, call one of us <laughs> or, you know, um, just do your research, do your research. It should not be anything that people cannot be transparent with you about in this process. Right. Now, and you, go ahead, Bryson. Uh, I was just going to say the one, there's only one area that you're not a hundred percent sure about with new construction and I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that uh, both Felicia and Tanisha can attest for this. Taxes, your taxes mm -hmm. are it's on my list. It's, it's guesstimated. Yep. It's um you know because when you're buying new construction, there's no tax assessed value or there's no tax assessment done on that property before it's built. It's done on the land. So therefore, within your first year. You're going to get a tax bill, which your lender should already kind of project what it could be, but they might not be 100% accurate. And it might depend on the area, how fast the area comes up. Um, taxes go up and down every year. Um, you know, everyone on here is a homeowner, so everyone can attest to it. They've seen, you know, that $1,000 mortgage go to 1100 go back down to 1000 or go to 980 It happens. And you have to be prepared for those uh, small things as well. I can tell you that when I bought my, when when we, when my wife and I bought the home that we live in right now, taxes were like $5,000 a year. Mm. And it's nothing. Mm. You know, because the value of the homes went up during the pandemic. So that's something you have to be prepared for. Your mortgage might not always be that $1,000. At some point, that mortgage can be $1,300. Wow. Yeah, and and a, go ahead, Felicia. I'm sorry. That's one of the things I would definitely say is a downside to the whole new build thing, right? Because mm -hmm. um, I'm going through that right now, right? It's mm -hmm. oh, you know, we projected it, and okay, now your escrow is short, so your mortgage is about to go up. And I'm like, okay, I knew it was coming. Like they said, it could happen, and it's happening, mm -hmm. right? And you do have to be um, ready for that because that's one of those things that I have written down here. That you do have to think about the mortgage, what it could be. It could go up, mm -hmm. it could go down. But you also want to think about so many other things that come along with that aftermath of buying a house. Like, okay, yes, mortgage, but then you want to think about electricity. How much mm -hmm. is my electricity going to go up? Utility you know, time. all of that. And I'm like, okay, utility bill used to be, you know, you got your little <laughs> 200 set aside and boom, that's it. And 200 mm -hmm. might be what it costs just for electricity, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to think about a lot. <laughs> and some of the stuff I thought about, but some of the stuff I did not think about, 
you know, I was like, oh, okay, all right, this is an experience. Mm -hmm. And then be ready for everybody to come knocking on your door talking about, hey, do you know, do you, I need to be your bug guy? I'm like, I don't want a bug guy. I can be my own bug guy. Oh, bug me. <laughs> you know, but um, you have to be ready for all that, you yeah, know, post. Home, yeah, I was going to say home ownership is a totally different beast because, like, when you're renting, you call the maintenance man, they fix it. But when you're a homeowner, it's all on you. Water heater brakes, yeah. all on you. Washer and dryer brakes, all on you. Air mm -hmm. conditioning needs repairing, that's all on you. Door needs fixing, that's all on you. Bryson, you got a point you want to make? See, so here's the thing, and a lot of people don't know about this. And, you know, for especially when it comes to new construction, you usually have it for one year. This thing called a home warranty. Not mm -hmm. your homeowner's insurance, but there's a separate, this is another bill, you guys, yep. a home warranty. Home warranty takes care of everything that the home insurance, homeowner's insurance does not take care of. Mm -hmm. So you talk about that, you know, water heater breaking or the garage door falling off or something like that. There is another way to take care of that where you pay a deductible versus paying fully out of pocket. And I would say, especially for first time home buyers or for people that are not as handy, take advantage of the home warranty. There are a lot of companies out here. Do your research. Some are not as good as others, but take advantage of that home warranty because, you know, who wants to come out of pocket every time something goes wrong? And they also do rebates. Um, if you buy new locks on your house, if you change a faucet, you change a door, you change a toilet, you can send them the receipt and, you know, you can get a rebate for some of that, most of that money back. Um, so again, we go back to not only the knowledge of what's out there for you, but read the benefits as well. A lot of people have these benefits and don't use them. Oh, man. Yeah, we're definitely giving true. you the keys here today. But I want to switch gears real quick and talk about North Carolina for all the wrong reasons. And you know where I'm going. Rocky <laughs> Mountain, North Carolina, man. That's the news. Thank God Northampton Halifax County wasn't up there. But there was a student at Rocky Mount High School. She went and put hands on a substitute teacher after the substitute teacher took her phone because the phone was being a disturbance in the classroom. Now, the young girl found out real quick that playing on rookie mode was totally different when you play all Madden. And she got the all Madden beatdown. Now, how back in our day, our parents grandparents, whoever raised us said, you, Friends, you family. bet not, you bet not, not better, bet, I'm country today, you bet not <laughs> go up to the old teacher because we had some teachers that had that yard stick at the ready. Mm. If that yard stick didn't work, you went to the principal's office and you got that board of correction. Yeah, I did not want that yard stick. I tell you that I never had I even. I was that. one of those kids that was like, mm -mm, I, I, was know not, I know you didn't get sent out of class, Jarrell. I know you didn't like get sent out of class. Scariest, Jarell. bravest person you ever want to meet. Scary and brave. No, no, no. I did not <laughs> want that. No, I'm telling you. no. But can we just talk about real quick how today's kids are built different and how you're kind of seeing the lack of respect for adults, elders, and how. It's really no disregard for, you know, respect anymore amongst today's generation. It kind of feels like they're that lost generation. Now we're considered the elders now, and it's our job to correct and to teach. But I think mm -hmm. the misinterpretation is when you give somebody correction, it's looked at as criticism. No, correction is to rectify your errors so that way mm -hmm. they won't become consistent and show pro and show in your actions so that way you can better be able to avoid the same situations next time felicia you want to go first yes felicia go yeah. first you're currently, an educator. <laughs> you're currently an educator i'm formally an educator i had to dip out for reasons unknown yeah i'm coming <laughs> go ahead felicia you, yeah. you go i go <laughs> okay I think, you know, I just think about my students. Um, I, there's so much there. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that it's a different population of students. I think it's a different upbringing. I do believe in giving voice to children. Mm -hmm. However, 
I do think they also need to know that uh, that line and that boundary. Mm -hmm. um, for me, um, I think I am the best disciplinarian and educator that I've ever been um, in the sense that um, I try to build the relationship with students. We've had conversations where I've had students who don't respect their parents, right? And if, to me, if you don't respect your parent, you're not going to re respect other adults. You know, that's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. that's just how I think about it. And I remember having a conversation with a student where she's just like, what if the parent's wrong? And I said, babe, even if your parent is wrong, you know, you they're still your parent and you need to give them a certain level of respect. And for this particular student, they felt like they were justified in their anger, in their backlash and whatever they wanted to tell their parent, they should be able to because they're wrong. And I'm like, parents can be wrong, but that doesn't give you the license to, you know, go off and whatever else. Would you go off on me? You better not. Cause guess what? I'm not your mama. Like I tell them that, like, I'm not your mama. I'm not your daddy. I'm not whoever you would treat that way. And so they don't come from me because I come right back at them and I'm not mm -hmm. afraid to. Um, am I afraid that it'll go to, you know, fighting? No, I'm not. Not with my students. I'm not because we've established a certain level of, we've established a relationship with each other. Um, I did have a situation situation at the beginning of the year where I could easily see myself being on the news I'm not lying and I took a couple mm -hmm. of days off work because I was yeah. like girl you went there <laughs> and she <laughs> took right, me there right. and I mean it was bad I mean it wasn't Miss Lockhart it was Felicia I was full blown you know so but I think that there's there's some things that, that children need today that they're not getting and you know we don't want to put it on, you know, necessarily parents because parents feel like they're bad parents, but there's something they need that they're not getting, you know, and there are some relationships that need to be established so that it doesn't escalate to fighting yeah. and, you know, whatever. But we got some angry kids out here. That's for sure. They're Tanisha. angry. They feel like they're not heard, you know, all that. Mm, Tanisha. Mm. You know, for me, it's it's heartbreaking. I am an educator. I remember almost 20 years ago, I'm not going to say anybody's ages, Felicia and Jarrell, but uh, I remember like yesterday, Felicia, you doing, you and whoever else was in the crew that were doing the Teach for America route, right? And my thought process was, I'm not teaching anybody. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I'm not teaching anybody's kids. It's cute. It's nice. But no, um, my counselor, you know, they were just giving us options. And I remember like yesterday, Felicia and a few other people, you know, um, went the route with the T. Who was it? Lash was it Tia? Lash I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know who it was. Song, yeah. So it was a lot of people that were doing it. And I was just like, mm -mm, that's just not my calling. Like, um, I'm not doing it. And so I get to college and what I was majoring in um I think it was psychology at the time I was like this teacher is mad weird I'm not doing that either like and so I ended up going into the teacher sector so here I am right and I and I was I was in education for about 15 years because I started in college I did daycare I started at the bottom pre-k infant so I know the ins and outs from every level um I did majority of my teaching in elementary sector but I'm licensed to teach elementary ed middle school English and high school business tech and I just feel like you know piggybacking off of what you say Felicia it's all it's obviously about establishing boundaries it's about establishing those relationships but not just with the kids my my approach was different as an educator I need to talk to your parents mm -hmm. um I know that it's a different generation I even have a seven-year-old and even though I'm old school that's my I, I, you know, I believe in um, treating people the other way, the way I want to be treated. And what's in me is just in me. I'm an old school educator. And so the, the society is different. You have a lot of kids having kids. But then I said, well, I was young when I had my daughter in college. You know, um, I really couldn't use that as an excuse. It's just, it's just a different time that we're in. I think morals and values and ethics are out the window. Um, 
the the world is kind of erupt by drugs, bad leaders, um, and the kids are suffering, right? So it's just one of those things where you have to have a relationship with the kids. You have to have a relationship with the parents. Um, I had this thing where if you're dis disrupting my class, I stop right there and I call your parents because I feel like if you're disrupting me, we're going to stop and we're going to call mom and dad. And so now everybody's disrupted. And you just have to have certain strategies that work. And you have to know you will not step to Miss Underdo. Now, Mrs. Burroughs, but you will not. We're not doing that. Because I might just hug you, seriously. like Because they're not getting the upbringing that we did as um, children. And, and that's not to knock anyone's parenting. But again, it's a different day. Um, kids are raising kids. And even with them may not being raised the way that we were raised or brought up, I feel like um, the kids are resentful. They are um, influenced by society. They have a lot more access to things that we didn't have. And so it's it's kind of hard to shelter your kids. They're, they're feeling insecure because they feel like you know, I see it on social media. This is how it's supposed to be because I see it there. I mean, even us as adults, like I see girls that get body work done, you know, and all these, and I'm like, hmm, maybe, I, but mine would be for enhancement because I have, I, but I'm, I'm secure. But, but as we age again, yeah. you see it and it's like, well, I can do that too. So I think it's just the numerous things. Um, you don't want to blame the parents. And where I was going with that is that Yes, it's a dip, uh, uh, excuse me, a different upbringing. It's a different era. But what if that parent is also doing the best that they can? Right. And then because you can do the best that you can and your child will still go here. You know, you're going left and they'll go right. So I think that we just have to stay prayed up in, you know, wherever higher God or whatever faith you believe in. Um, continue to be the best that you can be for those that look up to you. Because... Um, these kids are hurting, you know, and they are, I think COVID, I mean, we, I mean, come on guys, we've never experienced anything like this. And like my baby girl, she did kindergarten online. She's hurting right now. So it's a number, it's numerous things that are going on. I think that if you're an educator, just do the best that you can do. Establish those boundaries. Because like Felicia said, if you let them know, listen, and I'll do it in a jokingly manner. Okay. But we're not doing that. We're not, do you know, because you also still have to relate to them, speak their language, you know, but um, if, if you establish those boundaries, but not only boundaries, but those standards, mm -hmm. it changes the, the mindset of, of the children as well. Because again, you may be giving them something that they're not getting at home. You may be able to reach them in a way that people at home can't reach them. So just be cognitive of the entire situation of what could I don't think the teacher or the student was wrong I think I mean right or wrong I think well I think both of them were wrong let's just start there but I also think that teacher was a an a substitute yes so how was that fair to her you know we can't beat her up I mean she's not even a professional so she doesn't have the skill set that Felicia or Jarrell or myself or even Bryson has as a professional of how to deal with conflicts so, or so I, I you know I, it's it's broad but it says a lot you know and then the young lady she probably do that to her mother clearly she she's doing that to someone to fill that brain and so yes it does start at home but it also starts in the school system period not not with the teacher it starts in the school system because we can't be so desperate we let anybody in the classroom that's for one. And then um, the adults that the children are um, inspired by or surrounded by should be giving them good stuff, you know, not allowing them to see everything, not allowing them to be in every conversation because this is the end result. Mm -hmm. Bryce, in your two cents? Ooh. All right, I got <laughs> I got you. It's the tale of the two Libras. That's what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> so I got one Libra eight years old, straight A student, don't do nothing wrong except he won't clean and put deodorant on. That's the only <laughs> thing he did wrong. He will not clean and he won't put deodorant on. But how can you be mad at a straight A student that does no wrong? Now That's I got a minimal. 
I'm talking about he straight A student, never bothered in the class. Every teacher he's ever had loves him to death, wants him back. But then Come I to got, argument with your musk yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then that first little girl tell him that uh, you smell like onion. But then okay, that, well, he got that. Yeah, yeah. And look, I, I actually I kind of let it go just so that that could happen at this point because you got to learn from experience. Yeah, yeah, let them fall <laughs> on their face. They'll yeah. learn. So, you know, you leave them just enough rope, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that then, girl, she learned. She learned, though. That's one thing. Life will teach you. I'm glad you said that. I hate to cut you off, but I'm glad. That's probably the bigger piece of what any of us says is experience. Because we all make mistakes and we all have to learn. I hate that she had to learn that way. But that could very much so be my child that acts impulsive and think that she's on one once today and she's going to have to learn or he's going to have to learn, you yep. know, so good good point with experience. That's a great word. But here's the second tale of those two Libras. If my four-year-old daughter called me bro one more time. <laughs> <laughs> like, who are you talking to? Like, I am not your brother. He <laughs> <laughs> Call me daddy. I, I work hard for this. <laughs> I work hard for this title. But, you know, and, and it's a big difference. So um, the thing that I've learned, and my wife gets on me all the time. She says, oh, you treat the kids different. They're going to write I treat them different. Because I got one that's a straight A, you know, nerdy type. And I got a little thug. <laughs> No, I can't treat them the same. And it's the worst thing in the world because my son is like my acts like my wife and my daughter acts like me. So me and her have a different relationship. And I never thought this would happen. You know, people say when my daughter was first born, you know, you kind of you you, you kind of going to have favorites and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, no, nah, I ain't going to play the favorites. I kind of like my oldest more because I know him longer. But now I know both of them. And I'm not saying she's my favorite, but me and her relate different because mm -hmm. she be on what I'm on. Mm -hmm. You know, if I say, let's go right now, we got to go whoop, you know, I got, I need you to go beat mm -hmm. up this four year old. Oh, she with it. <laughs> she with it. And I'm like, oh Lord, like this is, this is me all over again. Yeah. So, but I'm learning me, I'm seeing me from a different bit. I'm seeing me from my own eyesight. And I know how to deal with me. Mm. You know what I mean? I know how to operate with me. You know, when it's just her and I, she never cries, whines, or anything. Mm. As soon as mommy get home. So, but I'm saying that to say when, and I tell people she a terrorist when she's at home, but as soon <laughs> as she leave the house and some other people are around or she's with some, you know, with day, at daycare or wherever else, she's an angel. So- <laughs> But it's all, and so you guys have said it, it's all about what their learned behavior and how they're brought up, you know, because I could teach her, and, and this is the saddest truth in the world. I tell people all the time, I say, I got one 529 program, which means that one of my kids' school is going to be paid for, the other one going to have to go to the military or start their own business. And I kind of already know which one going to go to school. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, but, but, but I also, but what I do is I, I understand that. So I embrace where my kids are. Mm -hmm. I embrace their understandings of life and I mold them from there. You know, whereas I'm an entrepreneur, I take my daughter with me wherever I am, because I understand that entrepreneurship might be the best route for her. You know, whereas, or, or like I said, even the military, that might actually get it right. I tell people, I wish I would have went to the military sometime, but I understand that I have one child that's probably destined today, just from today's aspect, he's probably destined to be behind someone's desk as a CEO, CFO, or somewhere like that. But I have another one that she ain't made to work for nobody. You know, we going to look when she gets to the age where she can work, she going to have to work for me and me and her going to fight. I'm going to fire her every other day. But I but it's a good that. thing. Yeah. And I cultivate that. So we're planting mm -hmm. seeds now for the future. And I feel like that's what most parents, that's where a lot of parents miss that mark. You know, understanding their kids. 
understanding their kids. My son was getting banned off of Roblox. He was getting suspended off Roblox to the point where he got banned. I had to create a whole new email address for this boy at five and six years old because he was hacking. Oh and, I didn't, and I didn't know he was really doing it. I kept saying, I'm fighting for him. I'm emailing Roblox, ad, oh. admin at Roblox or whatever. <laughs> I'm emailing them saying to them, how is the five-year-old hacking? Like, you can't tell me this five-year-old is hacking. Like, I'm, I'm going to bat for him. Yeah. You know, one day I came around that corner and I saw a screen with all kinds of numbers and letters up there. I was like, boy, what you doing? Like, you, you smarter than what I thought. And I knew you were smart. So, you know, but now... I want I, now he's going to coding camps. He's he's mm -hmm. learning these things, and I want him. And and so I'm I want to teach him how to ethically hack. Yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to curate that. I'm planting this seed today because I see what he can do and where he can go. Mm -hmm. I just sold that's house proper to, parenting. I sold a house to a 22 year old uh, man uh, last Monday. Five what was it five hundred and fifty thousand dollars to a 22 year old man. That man makes over a quarter million dollars a year at 22 years old. Hmm. Why can't my son do that? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And you have to speak, you have to speak life into them because again, but I'm gonna play devil's advocate, right? We can do all of that and they'll still stand up at a teacher and fight a teacher. So then what what do you do? You know, is there anything we can really do other than life experiences now you better know not to do that as a proper parent or as a proper parenting technique but you know it's life is tricky man i you know i feel for these kids because we have to in, we have to speak life into them like you said you're giving him something that's quality over quantity you don't have to do it that way you're speaking life into your child but all kids are not getting that and that's the minimal piece that the parent May it be their clubbing every weekend. May it be their strong. That's the because a lot of people had hard lives. Some mm -hmm. of us just superseded and overcame, and you know fought through because we had a community. But again, times are different. Um, and we just we just those of us that are still leaders out here in whatever capacity, may it be a level of success or just natural born leaders. We have to speak life into these kids and guide them because they're going to be our pilots. They're going to be our doctors. <laughs> They're going to be uh, in nursing home facilities when some of your kids don't want to take care of you. You know, they're going to be the ones that's fixing our food. These pe these little people are the future. So we cannot steer them wrong. No matter how troubled they are, what background they come from, we still have to speak life into these kids because they are our future. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I definitely I agree with that, that, you know, and seeing like how we mentioned earlier with social media and how kids have access to any and everything, you know, their mental health is, I'd say, a lot more fragile mm -hmm. than our generations was. It probably was, but just wasn't as talked about because like mm -hmm. one of us mentioned that we didn't have the tools that they have now. And, you know, especially with suicide rates going up, mm -hmm. and, like these kids today are crying for help, for somebody to say, acknowledge me, notice me. Mm -hmm spend time with me mm -hmm. and you know especially feed with me kids. a home cooked meal yeah yeah because yeah, when I was teaching you know I had one kid you know it, it was a dire situation where he was taking cereal out the cafeteria putting yeah. it in his backpack just so that he could have enough to eat to get him through yep. some kids getting weekend packs of food because school is the only meal that they're going to get yep. in the summertime you got the food trucks with the meals from the school districts coming around and that's how some kids eat yeah and some school districts don't even have that mm -hmm. yeah. some schools don't even allow kids to eat free mm -hmm. right and so i feel like what about us that are paying those tax dollars why can't my kids eat free like you don't know what people's situations are like we have to be you know that and, and that's another thing you know part of me coming out of education i'm still an educator at heart even in my role right now i'm I'm in the business of educating people my fulfillment is the impact that i have on other people um the only difference is now i'm i'm, I'm facilitating with adults <laughs> which is tough right but at the same time um 
my impact matters and you just have to be empathetic um, to people's situations because you just don't know. You don't know what people are going through. But why can't my kids eat free? Why can't we just, you know, and I said, if I were to go back into education, which is where I was going with the conversation, it would be from an administrative level or a political level where I, where, where I could make a difference. You know, my voice is too, you know, experienced and strong to just go back in the classroom. I need, I'm somebody greater. I, you know, I want to make kids be able to eat for free, you know, things like that, because you don't know what people's stories are. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you got to give everybody grace and mercy, because like you stated, Tanisha, you don't know what people are going through when they get on that bus to go home. You know, mom or daddy working two and three jobs and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how am I going to pay this bill this week? How am I going to pay that bill? How am I going to have so-and-so get watched when I don't have the money to afford child care? That's a whole mm -hmm. nother story for a whole nother conversation. Just the wild cost of child care, how some parents mm -hmm. are having to say, hey, which one of us is going to sacrifice not working in order to take care of this younger child because the cost of daycare is so high? That's why I think there should be some type of, like how health insurance is where you have a copay, there should be something like that for child care, mm -hmm. where that way folks are not having to make those decisions about who's going to sacrifice. What bill to pay and what bill not to pay. Or, child care. You know, um, yeah. and I, you know, I just want to highlight, and I'm sure all of you all can attest to this. Um, success doesn't mean that it came overnight. Nope. You know, I don't speak from, I don't, I don't speak from a boastful standpoint. Um, I've always been pretty blessed, but I've worked two and three jobs before. Like, just know that if your success is not today, it will come. My kids have seen me work two or three jobs and they've also seen me work this one strenuous job. So at the end of the day, those are the type of, 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 visuals you want to give your children that that uh, that allows them to continue to have an imagination and be a child and know that you can attain these things um let them see your struggles and your and your successes it's it's important it's so yeah, important because it teaches character and it teaches strength now look i'm i'm gonna say this this is probably an unpopular opinion right <laughs> we're gonna take it back to this uh little girl in the in the substitute that substitute was wrong. And I'm gonna tell you why. I'm gonna tell you why that substitute was wrong. We all saw the video, right? Mm -hmm. That weak ass punch that girl through. Yeah. You saw that coming a mile away. You could have de-escalated that. You ain't have to go yeah. after that girl. Where your mind at? But what if she hadn't a reflex then? See, I think it was all reflex. It was a because reflex. Because luckily, let, but hold on. Luckily she did. So she blocked with the left, but she came with the right. So you you it's it's very tricky. Yeah, and I, we, trust me, I ran it back five times, right? <laughs> they came around the corner like this. It was like <laughs> that's why I say nobody, because I thought she was gonna say it was a weak butt whipping. I'm not gonna say the name I want to say. No, no, I no, no. Say, I'm but... talking about the but I mean I'm just joking, but no, yeah, I'm wrong for you ever throwing the punch in the first place. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that as as I I understand that's a trigger, mm -hmm. but yeah. that is that's called you know discernment there is what there's right. some, some discernment there should be some you know uh self-awareness this is a kid you punch this kid you know something going down and the problem here is you could you you could have stopped it with the with the block hold on Even but let me play devil's advocate though wait a minute point. because but hold on because at the end of the day again it also goes back to professionalism and and fields and because you know they let anybody teach so that's why i say I, I can't just blame one person because when you're an educator they teach you about trigger points trigger warnings maybe not in that sense that may be my own you know um you know saying but i believe in trigger points and trigger warnings and as you become an experienced or professional educator even as substitutes they should have this where they teach you the trigger points and the trigger, they, they, you know your trigger points and you can identify the trigger warnings. The trigger warning was when she was aggressive. I seen the lady on the phone, things like that, but she's not an expert. An expert is gonna go out, I'm not getting on the phone calling anybody. I know this is a trigger warning and it's gonna push my trigger points. So let me walk outside and get somebody else or send a, I'm not even gonna get on the phone, but again, that comes with experience. 
And even if you don't have however many years of teaching, you have some type of training, just like they make you do CPR training for certain, it's mandatory. That's something they should, they should do like basic training for the classroom for subs. Felicia, you want to add something? I was going to say, I agree with that. I'm, I, I don't think we're giving this sub enough like right. credit, but like, yeah. it's a sub. Like, I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I haven't, even the training that you're talking about, Tanisha, like I didn't receive that type of training. Mm-hmm. Um, but like but no, but you have old. professionalism though. You've you you you've attained those years of professionalism, and so again, that's why I said, excuse me, it's it may be my own saying and my own way of living based on my expertise. But what I'm saying is, as a professional, you have learned that these are trigger warnings. Let me do this before there's a trigger point, and I react. So you would have handled it differently, even though there's not a specific training, you know, I think it would be great, but that substitute, she just, she just came to make her day pay. I mean, cause even after, you know, in between I've subbed, you know, I actually subbed at high school to see if I wanted to go into that sector, you know? Um, But I think that with, with, with years of experience and with professional training, those things become second nature. And I think she doesn't have, I, I feel that we don't have enough, um, she doesn't have enough training or expertise to even um, crucify her. I yeah. mean, yeah. I blame the school system. Um, luckily they have some type of law in Nashville County that says if someone's coming to you, then you have the right to, de- so she may be okay, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you have the right to defend yourself or something. Y'all need to read that. I did see that. Um, on the news clip or something is it was something to the magnitude where um if you feel offended or threatened or something part of my verbiage but you do have the ability to defend yourself you feel atta- you know so she may be okay again learning experience um proper placement in the workplace is so critical I from agree. higher le- low levels um but we're so the, the school system is so broken because they don't want to pay teachers Let's start there. I think we missed that when we were talking about parenting, when we were talking about upbringing, when we were talking about everything else, we failed because everybody hasn't made our money, Felicia or, or Jarrell or whatever. Everybody hasn't reached the peak of education. And I think that teachers are not inspired. They don't have it. There, there's nothing to drive them. Why would I like, that's why if a student run up on me, okay, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's I'm serious because they don't. I'm real. I'm willing to risk it all. You paying me forty thousand dollars to to do more than teach. I'm now babysitting. I'm the counselor. I'm and it's okay. And let alone if it's their passion or not. You know what about those career seekers and changers? So it's just so many factors where we got to start at the top. Yeah, we got to start at the top. Yeah, I I agree. And I want to shift to this. Last point before we get everybody up out of here, definitely great conversation talking about home ownership, talking about parenting and children of today. But I want to talk about college and how when we were in high school, college was being pushed as the only path to success. But now is you could go to YTU, U2 University, go to a trade school, go to a vocat school, um, other options to where you can have little to no debt possible. So can we just talk about real quickly the change in college education and how every year tuition goes up and how kids are like, unless I have the money to put the bill, the scholarships, I can't go because I don't want to be in debt. Um, Maybe I should start. I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead, Tanisha, go ahead. Y'all know I'm about to have two high schoolers, right? Hello, somebody, shoot me right now. Oh, um, So... <laughs> man, listen, I have invested so much in my kids. And, and you know, people think like I had to, was it my sister I was arguing with the other night or debating with? Because I told her, I said, when they graduate, they're on their own. <laughs> I said, because I was a first time um, graduate. A lot of us were, right? Especially, uh, I don't know, 04 is like family, come tell her how water, but yeah. a lot of us were first time graduates. So we didn't have anyone to tell us, do this, don't do that. You know, this is the road to go. This is not, I mean, I have two master's degrees and I'm, I, 
And let me tell y'all something. When we talk about home buying, see how it all ties? I don't know how I did it. My income to debt ratio was crazy. I did it without my husband. So again, when we talk about college, I have two masters. I have student loans that they will never get back. This is, do not listen to me, students. You're just going to do better. But I didn't have anyone, you know, I mean, because the income doesn't make sense. I mean, $200,000, how can I pay you? I don't care if I'm making a quarter million dollars of a year with inflation. I mean, you know, just factoring, but whatever. Um, and I tell my kids, you know, I don't, first of all, I do not tell them that you only have two options, blah, blah, blah. I don't do that. Because when you look at someone that goes to school for a trade, okay, and I went to school, I'm telling you, I'm super educated for whatever reason, but when you look at someone that goes to school for a trade, well, they'll come out making more money than me automatically right great let me know 85 to 90 percent of trades will make more money entering into the workforce all right that's number one number two um scholarships right do the scholarships we don't know if we don't read it may not even be as extensive as we think but we have to do those scholarships and minimize what we do pay i personally again parent a little differently my son has been playing football since he was five. My daughter has been doing chump, you know, comp cheer. I've traveled, I've done all these busy mom things. And so that's why I'm at a point now where, again, I'm old school. So your grades are first in my house. You can get whatever you want. I buy you a unicorn. If you got good grades and you're respectful and safe, you can get whatever you want because you've earned it, right? I teach them nothing is fair, it's, it's free. Um, but I feel like I've invested so much into you all during my years of attaining success. What else do I have left to give you? You're not going to have hundreds and thousands of dollars of debt. We're not doing that. Okay. We're just not. Um, if you don't want to go to a four-year university, you don't have to. Uh, if you want to go to the military, great. I think that would be marvelous. Just know the difference in between, you know, each branch. I'm not limiting them, but I am going to limit what I do for them because I have poured into you. So now you should get a, a full ride somewhere, right? Um, if you're not getting a full ride somewhere, okay, I, I'm not going to say I'm not going to help you, but you don't have to go through the things that I went through because I'm teaching you how to do it differently. Now, again, we raise our kids and what they do is on them, but I don't have anything else to give. I paid monies. I, I've already invested in you. Now it's time for you to invest in yourself. You know, if you need a little bit to help you or something like that, yeah, but I'm not, no, you're not going to have all that debt. And there are so many more options out here. Like we didn't have the chance to get an associate's degree in high school. They do. So guess what, <laughs> baby? I don't care if you winging it, you're going to get this associate. Okay. Oh, really? You can you can do um, a medical program while you're in school? Good. You're doing that too, right? So it's, okay, what you like to do? I know they have some, but my point is, I'm just a, I'm, a, I'm hard, I'm, I'm firm, I'm, but I'm flexible, but it has to make sense. I'm not doing it. After this, 18, you're on your own. As long as you can find your way, after I've given you all the tools, I'll help you. Like my daughter, she's already talking about in-state, out-of-state tuition. So that's, again, the impact I made on her where she already knows, you know, like, I mean, my kids won't even let, let me help them with homework, y'all, seriously. So sometimes it's a gift and a curse, but listen, <laughs> I can't help I'm, not. Kids with <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be in debt for you and me too. Yeah. Right. So, and you don't have to be. That's the first thing. Parents these days do not, do not, do not co-sign. Yep. These loans. Say do, it again for the folks in the back. Do not <laughs> co-sign on these loans. Yeah. No, That's no, no. First. Moving in now, the right direction, huh, Brian? Des <laughs> like Destiny Child. No, 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 no. Look, now, <laughs> look my wife is about to come in the house, and I hope she here because she know the deal. My wife went to school. I didn't, so I went to, I went to college. Uh, but we stayed BSU, but I didn't finish. I realized that it wasn't for me. So you're speaking from an educated as aspect um, through college, the traditional route. I went the trade school route. So I have certifications at HVAC, um, building engineer and all that. Now, truth be told, for a long time, I made more money than all of my peers. 
because of that. But at the exact same time, there is a ceiling at some point unless you're starting your own business. Mm -hmm. And that's where I had to learn. That was the differences that I had to learn was that, okay, what am I going to do after this? So I always had a plan on where I was going to go with it. And my wife came in the house so I could say that I'm going to say it now. Finally, I, I, she already knows that if she ever, if we ever get to a place where she's terminally ill, we get a divorce. I'm still a lover for life, <laughs> but I ain't paying her. I'm not paying her, um, her student loans back. That ain't my bill. We're going to take, we're going to run off on the plug. We're going to take this life insurance and we're going to put this money in the kid's name, but we ain't paying them bills. We ain't paying that student loan bill because. Cause why? Why are they? Why are they? You know? Why are they creating a avenue of debt mm -hmm. for young people? It's, it's predatory. We talk about mm -hmm. predatory lending and predator. Everything is predatory, but we don't talk about how schools are predators. Why mm -hmm. am I paying? Ooh. Why am I That's paying? Good. That's good. What's the average tuition, Tanisha? You got kids is about to go there. What's the average tuition right now? You can pay thirty to forty out the gate. I mean, I mean, it's just it's a different day. In state, yeah. it's fifteen thousand a semester. That's the average. That's the national average in state tuition, fifteen thousand wow. dollars per semester. So you're telling so so where are the and and you know we're talking about that's the average price of schooling. What is the <laughs> average? What's the average median income for the United States on wages or home or for um two parent well for two people households? Mm. Something like, like sixty to eighty. Yeah, something like eighty thousand. How can mm -hmm. I afford to pay for my kids' tuition? Mm -hmm. If I make mm -hmm. eighty thousand dollars, that means I gotta live on fifty. Because mm -hmm. you're already slicing How? thirty off the top. How? Mm -hmm. And then we we ain't even talking about taxes. Mm -hmm. So so how are we supposed to live like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you, you, you can't you can't man. I'll say for me, you know. I didn't know like how I was going to go to school because, you know, I didn't get scholarships. And all mm -hmm. I knew was, you know, FAFSA. But, you know, a lot of things end up working in my favor. And the one thing I would say to any incoming high school senior or current high school senior, network, 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 and have a good reputation. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a good reputation, doors are open for you. I'll give you this example for me when I was going into my senior year of college. I was at Mayflower in Rocky Mount having dinner with my mom and stepdad. And just by chance or happenstance, I should say, the superintendent of North Carolina County School Systems at the time was eating dinner a couple of rows down. So I was mm. like, oh, that's superintendent so-and-so. And I was like, I don't know if I should go to him and ask him for a recommendation for my school. And stepdad was like, you know, hey, go over there to him, say yourself. So went up there, long story short, ended up writing me a recommendation and then a couple months later, Felicia and uh, Tanisha, you can attest to this. I believe I was the first person out of our class to get accepted into a college. But I just say that to say how mm -hmm. networking is very important, but depends on the situation where if you want to go in certain professions, yes, schooling is your route. If you mm -hmm. want to go do HVAC, plumbing, hands on. trade, trade or more hands-on, vocational or trade school is more of your route and the military, if you play your cards right, that could be a very good career for you too if you want to go that route and also the GI Bill. They'll pay for you to go to school. Be yes, all that you can be or be yeah. in the proud. I mean, just, just different avenues. Go ahead, Felicia. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Felicia. I, if I could, um, you know, just listening to you guys and just thinking. Now, thankfully for me, I'm not going to lie, I have scholarships. Thank God for the scholarships. Mm -hmm. And college ended up being some of the best years of my life. Do I think mm -hmm. that it prepared me still for the workforce, for teaching, for the real world? I do not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, that was a hard transition. Going from college to like mm -hmm. the work, actual work, I'm like, I wasn't ready for this, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I loved hearing you talk about, Tanisha, was you know, saying, hey, at 18, you're on your own. I've given you the tools. And I think it's so important to teach kids how to think. You know, the discussions mm -hmm. we were having, Bryce, about, um, you know, like, this don't make no sense. I mean, we're paying this amount of money per school. You know, I make this amount of money per year. Having the your your kids or kids in general to think through that thing, what makes sense? 
Like, I think that's so important and teaching them how to dream. What life do I want? What steps do I need to take in order to get there? And finding out what's best. Who am I? What am I gifted at? What are my skills that I can bring to the table? I think for me, I learned my skills and my gifts after school. After school. Yeah, I didn't find mm-hmm. out during, but um, I think it's important that students learn early to start what they bring to the table. What am I good at? Um, there's a book called, uh, oh, What Color Is Your Parachute? And I bought it for um, some some young kids. Their birthdays came up and I wanted to give them something meaningful because they're in that high school age. And mm-hmm. that book, I like it and I'm an adult, right? But it's like a teen thing and it has all these little workbook things where you're finding out, you know, your strengths, you know, and what you're good at. So you can choose a career that's realistic and that's going to be satisfying for you, right? Because mm-hmm. the more you choose those type of careers, the better off you're going to be. And, you know, you can contribute to, you know, just a better society. So I think it just brought up for me to teach kids how to think and how to yeah. discover what's within them so that they can make a productive life for themselves. Yeah. And don't go to school and you don't know what you want to. I think undecided. I'm sorry, guys. I think that is the most ridiculous option. <laughs> I'm just I'm sorry. I mean, I think the way that they're moving in the world now makes sense because they have it where they're doing their basics as an associate in high school, if they're, you know, able yeah. to do that. Um, I think even if you're like super smart or mediocre, I think you should do it regardless because, right, we didn't all have perfect grades in college, you know, especially once you got. Oh, but oh. you know, perfect grades in college, though, college is a totally different ball game. And if you're unprepared for it, College will humble you really quick. They give you that look to the left, look to the right speech and fresh orientation. They say some of you will not be here by spring semester. And I believe we have Tanisha back on with us. And- I'm sorry, guys. It's technology. You know how that goes, but I'm back. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just think that's the most ridiculous option of being undecided because it's like, why are you here? You know, and again, like you said, Felicia, it starts with knowing who you are, what your skill sets are, um, and being ambitious, because even though we probably had no clue where we were going, like, yeah, I'm so multifaceted, like, I have all type of degrees, I can do whatever, never stop dreaming, and do not limit yourself, but that starts with going to school, and knowing, that's a part of knowing your purpose, okay, I think they should totally do away undecided. I think the way that they're moving in the world with where they're able to get the associates makes sense because that's where you're getting all your basics because that's when you're able to do undecided in college, right? But I think, again, what you were saying, Bryce, is the predatory piece. That's where they're getting that money off of us, right? So why am I here? And I don't know why the heck I'm here, but I'm going to still take whatever Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae, whoever they are, it's going to get, or the financial aid or your scholarship people are going to give me. But meanwhile, you're here with no purpose. So how do you have a passion if you don't know your purpose or at least have an idea, right? Because yeah. they used to ask us what we wanted to be when we grew up. So mm-hmm. we knew we started dreaming and, you know, some of us, but, you know, I just think it's ridiculous. And I think that um, undecided should be just wash. I yeah, think it's crazy. I, I agree. I mean, good thing colleges got rid of having those credit card companies come in and try to press wow. you with a free T-shirt or Frisbee or whatever <laughs> prize they will offer. Say, sign up for this low APR interest credit card. Don't get a credit card unless you, know you got the money to pay it back. And also yeah. you think you're balling on that refund check, hanging out on the yard at Thirsty Thursdays at somebody's college night. Just know that. You will have to pay that money back. I, I know you were probably up in there, Tanisha. You will have to pay that money back. Uh, college was the best five years mm-hmm. of my life. Met a whole mm-hmm. bunch of good people and wouldn't trade it for anything. But you just got to be smart about it nowadays. Responsible. You know, yeah. you want to be, be responsible. think responsibly, educate responsibly. Uh, also, the, prob- the money piece, I'm going to say this for those that do not know. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it one more time. Five 
29. If you don't know what it is, there's an account that you can open up. If you got a little one that you want to go to school or whatever, mm -hmm. you can just put X amount of dollars in. Hopefully it'll have some interest that it will grow. So by the time they hit 18, they have a nice little nest egg. If you don't have a 529, you can just open up a regular account for little Johnny, Susie, Sally, or Joe. So that by the time they hit 18, they have a little nest egg to where they can start off on the right foot. So it's all Whole about life policies. Look into investment groups. Whole yeah. life policies. Yeah. Investment groups. If if 529 or invest or, or whole life and in, in um, short-term disability or, or insurance does not resonate with you, please reach out to a financial advisor. You can contact one of us, but we will show you the way where it does not have to be hard and you will make smart decisions. Doesn't mean you're rich, mm -hmm. but you know, you are making fi smart financial investments. If you're not familiar with um, investing, call someone. I mean, I know people, you need to be financially literate. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah, please do. And like Felicia said, reading is fundamental. Read Absolutely. because industry rule number 4080, not record company people, but all people that do contracts, not all are shady. Shout out to Q-Tip. Mm -hmm. So definitely make sure you want to read the fine print. I say it again. Before you sign anything. Read yeah. the fine print or else read you're going to be no Vaseline style. Shout out to Ice Cube. So mm -hmm. any shout outs we want to give before we conclude this interview and also give your info out Tanisha and Bryson if folks want to know more about real estate or investing or just get hip to some jewels um my name again tanisha underdo formerly i'm tanisha burrows straight from the 252 north yes. carolina um i've seen a lot i've done a lot and i'm not going to talk about anything i have not experienced if you know me you know that to be true um and i just want you to be great be greater than me and i'm 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 available shoot me an email tanisha underdo at gmail.com dm me um, reach out to Jarrell. I'm around and any jewels I have, I'm not afraid to drop them. Peace and love. All right, Bryson. Well, uh, I'll make this easy for you. Uh, Google me. If you Google <laughs> my name, I'll be the first thing to pop up, I promise. All right, Felicia. Well, for me, you can uh, maybe Google me. I'm not sure that I'm the first. Uh, so <laughs> Facebook me, feel free to um at felicia m lockhart um and yeah i'm around or reach out to jarell yeah, you can reach out to me and I'm about to make this shout out list longer than the 90s posse cut. So shout out to all of the 252, Halifax, Northampton, Nash, Weldon, PJ, Trellacourt, Hook Road, WB, <laughs> Akinichi Net, 46, 48, Lake Gaston, Henrico, all the surrounding areas in between. You can catch this interview wherever you stream podcasts and on YouTube at youtube.com slash beyond the album cover. Also shout out to the 336, by the way, Greensboro and surrounding areas, UNCG. 919. Here for college. <laughs> Elon 919 910 704 828. Shout out everybody, you. everybody know UNCG is the best school. Even we Shout still under, we're still undefeated in football, so I got bragging rights. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching and listening to this very special episode of Beyond the Album Cover with Tanisha Burroughs and my family, Bryson Daniels and Felicia Lockhart. Thank you guys for coming on, and uh, hopefully, we can do this again soon. Yes, thank Definitely. you. Definitely. Take care. Thanks for having us. No problem.